guys, welcome to the Vertical Life Church online experience. I'm Kelly and I'm so excited to welcome you to our global community. We want to awaken and empower you in your walk with Jesus. And so we're gonna bring you some powerful worship and an awesome message. Check it out. Good morning, Vertical Life Church. This is your call to worship. Listen, last week we taught on worship a little bit. We gave a little biblical context for why we lift our hands. It's actually a word in Hebrew, yada, to worship with extended hands. We spoke about how this is a safe place to enter into worship, to express biblically our love and adoration for the Father. We can do that with singing, with shouting, with lifted hands, getting on our knees, getting on our face. All of this stuff is not only acceptable, but encouraged here in this house. We are a house that worships the Lord. Amen? So I just love to invite you this morning to lift your hands, just as a sign of surrender. We're standing as a sign of honor. King Jesus, we honor you. We're gonna enter into this song this morning that sings of your lordship, your kingship. God, not only are you the king of the earth, you're the king of everything, the entire universe. So we declare it this morning, and we make this moment count. We come to worship you in spirit and in truth, and we love you, Jesus. We love you so much. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation loves so 
stay in this heart posture um, just of worship for just a few more minutes. I believe that the Holy Spirit um, wants to just release a spirit of boldness um, in this room. And I'll tell you what I mean. So first of all, Pastor Jeremy's continuing in our um, series about the Holy Spirit. And the, the evidence, the number one evidence, <laughs> I believe, and we have taught in this church of being filled with the Holy Spirit is boldness, right? And I think we think of that a lot of times as boldness in ministry, boldness to preach, boldness to prophesy, and all of those things are true, but it also means boldness in the secret place, okay? Boldness in the secret place. When we were just singing about confidence to enter, if you were having a hard time connecting with that song, then this is for you, okay? So I don't know if you guys remember in the story of Esther, for her to go before the king with a request, her own husband, she fasted and prayed for weeks. She chickened out multiple times, kept calling banquets because she was afraid. Because why? The consequence of coming before the king without his invitation, if he did not receive her, was death. And it's the same for us. It says the wages of sin is death, right? But we have boldness to go because in the courtroom of heaven where the accuser would say these are the lists of reasons why you why this sinner can't come this is the list of reasons she's angry she's bitter she still hasn't forgiven that person she cheated she whatever make the list as long as you want Jesus said I wiped her slate clean right and he gave us the righteousness of Christ so when God the Father who's the judge looks at you he sees the righteousness of Christ and so when you're walking through and you hear that voice of the accuser that says no 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 no, you can't go pray and ask God that you can't go that you can't show up to that small group you can't show up to that service you get to hold a clean slate and say you don't get to say that anymore you don't get to say that anymore and this is boldness in the secret place that means when you go home and you're anxious you say I I get to go to the King of Kings. I have an open invitation to the secret place. I have an open invitation to his presence and there is nothing that can separate me from that, nothing. And so that is received by faith, okay? And so this morning we just have a few more minutes. I want you to just connect. If the worship team could just play just for like a few more minutes. This Don't let this moment pass you by. This is not for someone else. This is for you. That means tomorrow when the accuser comes into your mind, when the accuser goes to accuse you, you get to say, you have no right to accuse me anymore. You have no right to accuse me anymore. I can go boldly. You know what's bold? You know what's bold is to believe that the King of Kings in His holiness, in His perfection, died for me while I was still sinning. Not when I said I was sorry. Not when I said I was going to be better. When I was still sinning. That's bold. That's bold to say when I was still sinning, He died for me. And not only that, but He crucified my old self with Him and raised me to life with Christ as a new creation. So Holy Spirit, I pray this morning, in these next few minutes, You would release a spirit of boldness in our congregation to come to You, to believe in faith that no greater love has, has a man than this, that He would lay down His life for His friends. I'm Your friend. I'm the one You love. I say with boldness that I'm Your friend. I'm the one that You love. I'm Your friend. I'm the one that You love. And I come to You, Jesus receiving that love and that salvation in Jesus name.
We're so glad to have you as a part of our online family today. We couldn't put on this experience without your generosity and support. If you'd like to partner with us as we continue to spread the gospel, there are two ways that you can give at Vertical Life. You can text any amount to 84321, or you can go to verticallife.info and click give. We believe that God has something awesome to teach us today, so let's prepare our hearts as we continue in our service with an awesome message. All right, guys, so we're on part three of this series called Walk With Fire, which is all about being filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so if you haven't listened to the first two, uh, uh, two messages of this, I encourage you to go listen to those because today's the third one that's going to build on top of those things. I do think it's important that you hear all of them so that you have the stepping stone on what we're uh, uh, teaching on. So today, you know, I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to do a 30,000 foot view of the Spirit spiritual gifts. And what I want you to see and what I want you to understand is that there is absolutely no evidence in Scripture that gives us permission to ignore or dismiss the spiritual gifts. In fact, I would argue the opposite, that we're commanded to pursue them. And I'm going to lay that out here for you here in a moment. But what I want you to understand, and I have a strong conviction of this, is that if you call Jesus your Lord and Scripture is your foundation, then you are commanded to pursue the spiritual gifts. So I would, in fact, maintain that there's two things when it comes to the spiritual gifts that we see in Scripture. The first is this. Following Jesus should place a demand on the spiritual and supernatural in our lives. I'm going to lay out a bunch of scripture because I know for some individuals, there's been a theology built up in your minds against the active role of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so what I want you to see is that you, that it is available for you to see that it's, it's something that you and I are called to pursue. And that if you're following Jesus, there should be a demand on the supernatural in your life. Look at these passages. Matthew chapter 10. 7 through 8 says, Jesus is saying, he's saying, and, and proclaim as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do what? Heal the sick. Come on. Raise the dead. Cleanse lepers and cast out demons in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're seeing that happening in this church body. I got a, a, a photo from someone the other day where they were just performing a deliverance and praying over someone, and it was a picture of their tarot cards being burned in the fire, being freed from black, power, uh, black uh, magic. Amen? Come on. Another verse in Mark 16, 17 through 18 says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any, any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Acts 1.8, Jesus is saying, but you will receive power. Ask yourself this question. Do I have power in my life? Jesus is saying this. He's saying you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now remember, he's saying this to the very disciples that he already breathed the Spirit upon them in John 20. And here he's telling them, hey, I want you to wait to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 18 through 19. Notice what Paul is saying here. He's saying, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. How? By word and deed, which most of the Christian body is comfortable with that. Word, teaching, and good acts and deeds. But he continues, by the power of what? signs and wonders. Come on, church, by the power of what? Signs and wonders. And by what? The power of who? The Spirit of God. He says this, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled what? The ministry of the gospel of Christ. So he's saying the ministry of the gospel of Christ entails these things, word and deed, signs and, water, uh, signs and wonders, and the power of the Spirit of God. Are those things a part of your life? 
So I would say that if you're following Jesus, there should be a demand placed on your life for the supernatural. The second argument I would make is that loving the church body should place a demand on the spiritual gifts in your lives. And that's what we're going to unpack here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. You can read those, read those chapters and you can see where there's a demand placed on you that if you want to love the church well, there's a demand for the spiritual gifts to be placed in your life. So what I want to do today is just lay a foundation regarding the spiritual gifts. But first, I want to mention some of the rebuttals about the spiritual gifts. And this is not an exhaustive list. So please, I'm not trying to give you an exhaustive list. I'm just trying to give you some of the rebuttals that people offer up as reasons not to pursue the spiritual gifts. The first one is this, a lack of experience. Basically saying that not seeing or personally experiencing the supernatural. So since I've never seen it or experienced it myself, then they're not real today. Well, First, logically speaking, this doesn't make any sense. If we were to determine the validity of something based on our personal experience alone, then we would be left with a very biased and distorted view of the world. For example, if someone has not experienced the Heavenly Father, does that mean he does not exist? Has someone not experienced a healthy marriage? Does that mean healthy marriages do not ex- exist? If you've never seen the ocean, experience the ocean. Does that mean oceans do not exist? If you have never experienced pain or depression, does that mean it doesn't exist? So it's illogical to say that just because I haven't experienced something that I have the right to dismiss it as not real. The second thing is this, that scripture makes no room for us to determine truth based on our personal experience. I'm going to say that again. Scripture makes zero room. Say zero. Zero room. He has no room for us to determine truth based on our personal experience. Now, I, I, have a, I have a brother who I fasted and prayed for to see healed. I gave a lung to him. I'm missing a lung on this side. And so he has cystic fibrosis. And I prayed and I fasted for him to be healed because he, I got a phone call that he was brain dead. I believed with everything inside of me for his healing, and I did not see it happen. I watched my brother take his last breath inside, uh, before me. But guess what? That does not give me permission to say that God does not heal. I still believe that God is a God that heals, and I see it, and I witness it. Why didn't it happen in that situation? I don't know, but I'm not the authority over Scripture. And so you have to understand that Scripture truly makes no room for us to determine truth based on our personal experience. And some of you, there will be a, a, a stabilizing effect that happens in your life if you would begin to, to, to uh, uh, not allow your emotions and your experiences to dictate what's true in your life. Just like Davis was talking about this morning, whether you feel it or not, the blood of Jesus is sufficient. And we as Christians have to stop allowing our feelings to rule us and to lead us and believe Scripture for what it says. Another rebuttal is that God has withdrawn these gifts, that there's no need for them today. So if these gifts were given for the maturation of the church, then why would they only exist during the early stages of the church and cease to exist during the bulk existence of the church? Has the church reached full maturity yet? The answer is what? No. So if these gifts were given for that reason, then why would they be removed right now? In fact, Joel 2 says that in the last days that God would pour out his spirit in all flesh. And right now we are living in the last days ever since the resurrection of Jesus. Another rebuttal that we're given sometimes is is this, that which is perfect has come, meaning that the word of God has come, the canonization of scripture. This is pulled from 1 Corinthians, if you want to look there, chapter 13, verse 8 through 10. It says that love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Now, what is falsely uh, um, Applied here is saying that that perfect calm is the canonization of Scripture. That's not what it's referring to. In fact, if in fact, that word there is teleos, which means perfect. It does, it's not logos, which means word. And what he's talking about here in context, what Paul was referring to, is he's speaking of our maturity. 
And so you have to ask yourself once again the question, are we there yet? As a church, as individuals, are you there yet? Are you fully mature in Jesus? And the answer is no. So if Jesus gave the ascension gifts or the offices, which we see in Ephesians 4, you know, the apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, the pastor. If we see those given for the maturity of the body, and if we see the spiritual gifts are given for the maturity of the body, then that means they're not going to leave until the body's fully mature, and the body's not fully mature yet. And so what he's talking about here is our maturity, not receiving the, the word of God. Another uh, rebuttal is abuse. Now, no one's going to say this. No one's going to go around and, and, and say, hey, because of abuse, I don't believe in spiritual gifts. But we do. We use that. And what we see here in Scripture as we get into it is that actually Paul was addressing abuse. But he told them to lean into the spiritual gifts more. Why? Because it's not an issue of whether Paul thinks we need the gifts of the Spirit or not. It's God's plan and design to mature the body and advance the gospel, period. And what we do sometimes is when we see abuse around something, we dismiss it from our lives. Listen, I've mentioned this before. I'll mention it again. There's been so much abuse around the Word of God. Would you agree with that? Do we dismiss this? No. No. But we dismiss the spiritual gifts because we've seen abuse done in the name of the Spirit. We don't have that right. We don't have that authority. If you want to disagree with Jesus and Apostle Paul, go for it. I'm not. For charismatics, I want to make a side note about for charismatics. You grew up in a, a Pentecostal church. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 2 says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am what? Nothing. So a clanging cymbal. So in my opinion, this is what we see And what people experience when spiritual gifts are separated from purpose and love, clanging cymbals and noisy gong, which is irritating and annoying. And so he's saying that if you're doing these spiritual gifts without love, then you're nothing. Why? Because you're not edifying the church. You're irritating the church. I want to read a couple of passages here for you because because what we have to ask ourselves is, what is the spiritual gifts for? Can anyone even answer that question? Is it to make us super Christian? No. It's for the edification of the church and the advancement of the gospel. And you cannot disconnect the passion for the gifts from the purpose of the gifts. Whenever you do that, there's perversion. You should have such a deep love for the church that you desire the spiritual gifts. Remember, you cannot separate the passion from, for the gifts from the purpose of the gifts. You will always, every time, end up in some form of perversion. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 says, look, look at this. I didn't give them the, the, these passages to put on the screen, so if you want to turn to them your, for yourself, 1 Corinthians 14, 12, look what it says. Paul's writing. He says, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. That's what he's saying. Like if, you want, if, you, if you desire, once again, if you have a passion for the gifts, don't separate it from its purpose, which is for the edification, the building up of the church body. And a lot of times those things are separated. And that's where you see some weird, strange things. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. And what, he's, what he was just writing to you is about order around spiritual gifts. And so people that say, hey, I'm spiritual, I do what, what I want, they're violating this command right here from Paul. He's saying that if you call yourself a true prophet, if you are spiritual, then you're going to recognize and acknowledge the order and the design that God gave for the church. And there's too many people that in the name of the Spirit, they go off and do their own thing. And what happens is it causes more harm than good. 
Remember, I'm, I'm going to say it again. You cannot separate the passion for the gifts from the purpose of its gifts. gifts. Every time, you're going to end up with some form of perversion. And so what I want you to see, though, just in this beginning part, is that truly, if you call Jesus your Lord, and if Scripture is your foundation, then you don't have a choice but to pursue the spiritual gifts. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. I'm just going to lay out just a 30,000-foot view of these spiritual gifts. And so you kind of have an understanding of what, what each one of them is for. And so first off, know that Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, which is kind of a seaport city church. They're a little bit free and a little bit uh, stuck on materialism and, and big in the philosophy and self-glorification, a little bit vain. Uh, they rely on themselves. And their own human ability. Um, I would say, if you're from there, don't. I, I don't mean to offend you, but it's, I would say, think kind of like New York City, San Francisco, or Miami. You know, kind of have that the mindset of this church, the context that he's writing to. And there is some abuse happening within this church, and he's going to address some of that that we're going to see here in a moment. But what I want to do is I want to walk through this passage with you guys and explain each one of these gifts. So let's first read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 11. Now, Paul is saying here, he's saying, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be what? Come on, church, what? Uninformed. Concerning what? Spiritual gifts. So the first question you need to ask yourself is, are you uninformed of the spiritual gifts? Because Paul's giving a clear command right here. He's saying, I do not want you to be uninformed about the spiritual gifts. You know what that word uninformed means? It means willful ignorance. Willful ignorance. Do you, are you aware of the spiritual gifts? You know, this is what we kind of do. We like, we do a kind of, I would call it a build-a-bear theology. You ever know those little build-a-bear stores? You go in, you build a bear, and you pick out his eyes and his body and his ears and dress him up and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's how we approach Scripture and following Jesus. We just take what we want and we build a theology of what we're comfortable with. If you're comfortable with your theology, you're probably not following Jesus. There should be parts of following God that scares you and offends you. You can't go, you can't approach God and say, hey, I'm going to take a little bit of the word, but I don't want the spirit. I'm going to take the spirit, but I don't want the word. I'm going to take the blessing, but I don't want the poverty. I want to take the strength and the power, but I don't want the, the moments of insecurity and, and fear and doubt or whatever. Like you, when you follow Jesus, you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to take whatever you have in front of me. I want all of you. And we can't just build our own doctrine or theology around what we are comfortable with when we follow Jesus. And so Paul is making it very clear right here. He's saying, I am telling you, do not be ignorant when it comes to the spiritual gifts. And for some of us, we're more aware of our personality, our personality tests like DISC or our Enneagrams are numbered than we're aware of what spiritual gifts God has given us. If I ask you right now, what number are you on the Enneagram, most of you probably would be able to answer it. If I ask you what spiritual gift God has given you, you probably wouldn't know. And Jesus is telling us here, or Paul is telling us here, do not be ignorant when it comes to the spiritual gifts. And then he raises the ante. If you look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, he says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So he's saying here, don't just be aware of them and have knowledge of them. I'm telling you to eagerly go after them and to pursue them. And so we have to ask ourselves this question, am I desiring and running after the spiritual gifts? Because Paul is telling us that here, right now. These, these things are supposed to take a place and play a part in our lives. Let's continue in verse 2. He says, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. 
So I want to stop there. Paul was very aware of the pagan religions and spiritual activities that was taking place, and it was kind of leaking into the church. So he was addressing that. Verse 4 says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? The common good. Like it's supposed to be for the common good of the church. You know, which is unfortunate because a lot of times we have no desire really to even love the local church or to serve the local church. We're more concerned and consumed about our own lives and what's convenient for our, ourselves than to give any time into serving or lo- loving the local church. In fact, it's kind of sad. Barna did this research and asked this question. What's the number one thing you're looking for in, in a church? You know what the answer was? Someone said donuts. That's a good one. Do you know the number one thing people are looking for? Not to be needed. The number one thing. Not to be needed. And so we approach church just to consume rather than serve and love the body of Christ. And he's saying here, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? Not for yourself. Not for yourself, but for the common good. Verse 8 says, For to one is given through the Spirit the utterances of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who are apportioned to each one individually as he wills. And so what we see here is that spiritual gifts are given through the Holy Spirit to edify, to exhort, and to encourage others in the local church. It's the Holy Spirit loving others through our lives. And so what I want to do is I'm just going to break down these spiritual gifts and give you an idea of what they are. And what's going to happen is for some of you, as I explain it, you're going to say, hey, that's me. That's me. I'm going to give you language for what you've been experiencing. And you thought it was just you. No, it's probably the spiritual gift that you've been given at work in you. And now you need to grow it and exercise it and practice it. So I'm going to break it down to three different categories, okay? The first category of spiritual gifts is what we can call revelatory gifts, all right? In this category, you have things like word of wisdom or utterance of wisdom. This is where you just know what someone should do. You know things that you shouldn't know. And you know how they should do it. You just, you just know. It's like, I don't know how I know this, but I believe this is what you should do. It's like a divine wisdom. You could be operating in the word of wisdom there. The other one is a word of knowledge or utterance of knowledge. This is where you just know things and you don't know why you know them. Like you're, you're around someone and maybe a phrase or a word or an image or a feeling, you experience something, you say, hey, does, does this name mean anything to you? Does this season of life mean anything to you? And what that is is a word of knowledge. You know something that you have no, no context in and you should have no reason of knowing it, but you do know it. You know, sometimes this happens for me doing premarital counseling. There'll be a moment where I'm like, hey, hey. And I'll ask, and I, I remember this one time I was sitting in a coffee shop and, uh, with, this, with this couple doing a premarital counseling session, and I was talking with them, and I said, oh, well, stop a second. And I asked her one question, and, and she just broke down crying. It was information I shouldn't know, but it was a, 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 it's like a word of knowledge moment. And there's been moments where I missed it because I was scared. Like I remember this one time at this, this conference, I was up front, serving in the, uh, in the altar ministry, and this young guy came up to me, and I was praying for him. And for some reason, I kept thinking about his parents, something about his parents, something about his parents. And I was just like, no, he didn't come up here to be prayed for about his parents. So I just prayed for him. And it's kind of a, you know, you, you know you're on a spot. You don't know what to pray for. You pray just a, a generic prayer. God bless him, love him. 
God bless them, love them. God bless them and love them, you know? And, and, and then I was done praying for him, and I just sat there and I talked to him for a little bit. And then he began to open up to me about his parents and how they're going through a divorce and it's wrecking him. How wonderful would it have been to him in that moment if I said, hey, is there something going on with your parents? And how much would that have shown him that God's aware of his situation and open the opportunity to love on him? And so be aware of those things when you're praying for someone and you're going to miss it. Don't accuse, just ask. Like, hey, does this mean something to you? Does this, why do I keep getting this name? Or why do I keep getting this age? Does something happen when you're 15? Be aware of those things and practice those things. We see this, we see this through Jesus in John 4, 16. Jesus is speaking, and he said to her, go call your husband and, and come here. And the woman answered him and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to, to her, you're right in saying this. I have no husband. For you have, ha- you have had five husbands, and the one you know you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And so what, she's, what he's realizing there is that's a word of knowledge. He's saying, hey, you're right. This is actually what's going on in your life. Another uh, revelatory gift is the discerning of spirits. Now, this is not discernment. This is discerning of spirits. And this is where it's the ability to uncover the nature or motivating source behind people, events, or or beliefs. This is something that I believe is another gift that I, I, I seem to operate in more. There'll be situations where like, hey, something's not right behind this right here. I sense there's a spirit at work here. And usually it's when the kingdom of God in, in, a, in, a, in, in the kingdom of darkness is kind of clashing. You know, when you're in a situation, you're talking to someone, they're saying all the right things, or you're in a situation and everything seems right, but there's something is off, like there's something not right. You're discerning a spirit at work there. We see this in Acts 16, 16 through 18. Look at this. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Now she followed Paul and us crying out. Now look, look what she's doing. She's saying good things. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Doesn't seem like anything's wrong there, right? Verse 18. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the what? The Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very hour. And so he realized even on the surface, like what she was saying was right and true, he realized there was something else at play, and he looked at her and called out the Spirit. And so that's a discerning of spirits. And for some of you, you may operate in that. There might be moments where you're like, hey, just something's not right here. Something's at play here. There's another force involved here. Be aware of those things. So that's your first category. Your second one is power gifts. All right, this is the first one is the gift of faith. This is where you just have a radical confidence in God's will for a specific situation. So much so that you just act. You're around those people, they have so much confidence about something. Hey, I know God's behind this. I'm just going to do it. You know, that's, that's a gift of faith. And for some of you, that might, may be you. Like you operate in that. You just know that you know that you know that you know that your knower knows that, you're going, that God's going to move. So you step out and do it. That's a gift of faith. We see this in Luke 8, 46 through 48. It says, uh, Jesus said to him, someone touched me. For I perceive the, that power has gone out from me. And when the woman, woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. She knew that if I just step out and touch the hem of his garment, I would be healed. And so that's where we see a radical confidence that leads to action. If it doesn't lead to action, it's probably not a gift of faith. Another power gift is the gifts of healing. Now, you need to notice here it says gifts, not gift of healing. And the reason that's important is because no one is the healer. You're just the mailman. It's very important to notice the difference. You see it there. It says gifts of healing, not gift of healing, because no one's the healer. Only Jesus heals. 
We are just the mailman. And so what happens when we lay our hands on people and we see them restored physically uh, and emotionally? This can happen through inner healing. This can be physical healing. And, man, we are seeing healing take place within this body, and it's amazing to witness. And I just want to see an increase of it in this body. Amen. Another power gift is a working of miracles. And this, there's really just no explanation for this. This is just where it's just a supernatural working of the Holy Spirit. This is where you look back at it and you tell yourself, you, I have no clue how that happened. Like, I have no clue how that happened. This is like Jesus turning water into wine. It's a, it's a miracle. You know, I, I, I wasn't old enough to realize it because I was just born. I was an infant. But there was a time in my life I checked with my parents, and uh, they, my parents are separated, and they told the same story. You know, so I, I, I measure the stories against each other. They t- told the same story, but when I was born, I wasn't supposed to live. I had a, a hole in my lung. I, was supposed, I wasn't supposed to make it through the night. And so my dad knew about it, but my mom did not at the moment. And so he told me the story where he said that he was just asking God, God, why, why? He was crying out. He was mad. He was frustrated with God. Here I have my son, and he's not going to. The doctors just told me he's not going to make it through the night. He has a hole in his lung. And he's just frustrated with God. Have you ever been frustrated with God? Come on, we, we, we can be honest in this place. I've been frustrated with God. And uh, he was one, having those moments, and he was just crying out to God. And he said that he was walking through the stairwell of the, church, of the hospital and uh, uh, just walking up it. And he heard God. He says that he heard God. To him, it was audible. And what he heard it was just one line, why do you doubt me? That's all he heard. And then he got up, sta- he got up to the room and... F- no one knows why, but the, the hole in the lung was completely, completely disappeared. It was gone. There was no reason for it. It was gone. And so that is, that's just a miracle. And so you'll see and experience those things working of miracles. And so that's the third power gift. Now, this next category is the utterance of vocal gifts, all right? And you have two of them in this category. The first one is the gift of tongues, all right? Now, Listen, I'm going to speak freely on this in a sense of I'm going to give you my opinion on the gift of tongues because I know there's a lot of confusion around it. And I just hope this helps you. It's something that helps me. But I'm asking for your grace as I explain this to you. All right. When it comes to the gift of tongues, I, in, my opinions, there's, in my opinion, there's three types. All right. The first is this. It's for evangelism. And I don't think everyone operates in this, all right? And this is what we see in Acts 2, 6. Read this passage with me. It says, And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in what? In his own language. It wasn't a different unknown language. They heard it in their own language. And so I think there's a gift that some people have that they'll be in foreign countries and for some, some reason, they don't speak Spanish, they don't speak German, they don't speak Korean, but the gospel comes through them in the native language of the country that they're in, and they don't know it. Like I've heard of stories, I have not experienced it, but I've heard of stories where someone would be praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit, and an individual will walk up to them and say, hey, you speak perfect German. How would you learn that? And like, I don't know German at all, but you just spoke perfect German. And what that is right there, I think, is a moment of evangelism where God gives someone the gift to be able to speak a foreign language. The second thing I would say is, is, is what we see in 1 Corinthians 14, which is a gift of tongue given for the edification of the church. Now, notice that when Paul talks, he doesn't say it needs to be translated. It says it needs to be what? Interpreted. So what happened here, this is a heavenly tongue, and there needs to be an interpretation. This is where you're in a church service. And someone gives a tongue, and no one knows what it means, and then it's followed up by an interpretation. And when there's an interpretation given to it, what happens? It brings understanding, and it does what? Edifies the body. So remember, a passion for the gift separated from the purpose of the gift will always lead to perversion. So if you have just someone shouting out in tongues in the middle of service, and there's no follow-up of interpretation, remember, not translated, but interpreted, 
then it's going to lead to what confusion in the, in the congregation. And so what I, I don't believe, this is my opinion too, I don't believe that that gift is available to everybody. I think there's certain people that operate in it. And the reason that I know some people would disagree with this, and I, I'll be honest, I have some tension around it myself. I was having a conversation with a friend about this the other day. But the, I, I believe that there's moments where Everyone might be able to operate in all these spiritual gifts, but I believe that God specifically gives certain individuals a charisma or a gift in that area. The reason being is because if one individual operated in all those spiritual gifts, then there's no need for a body, right? But if everyone has a grace around a specific gift, then you need each other. The person who gives a tongue needs someone to, to interpret it. You know, if someone has an infirmity, you need someone to pray for, a gift, for the gift of healing, for healing to be uh, done in the moment. You know, so I think there's a need for the body. That's why when I say this specific gift here, the edification of the church is not, I don't think everyone operates in it. Or even for evangelism, I don't think everyone operates in it. But I think it's a gift that's given to specific individuals. But the third one, the third version, I believe, of the tongues is I do believe it's a gift that's available to everyone, and that's the, it, because it's an edification of yourself. It's your prayer language. I do believe, this may make you feel uncomfortable, but I definitely do believe that that gift is available for everyone. Why? Because notice, the first two gifts is for evangelism or the edification of the church body. The third one is edification for yourself. Why would God give, this is me being, I'm just taking some liberty here, okay? This is me saying like, okay, so why would God give you a gift to edify yourself but not give that gift to me? Like when you read the scripture, it edifies you. It can build you up. When you worship God, it edifies you. It can build you up, realizing how amazing and how awesome it is. is. So you're saying that he, the prayer language that is meant to edify yourself is only given to certain individuals. That is where I have, that's where I, I, I will push back and disagree. I think that that gift is available to everyone in this room. But we have a theology built up against it, and we don't think it's available to us. Or it makes you feel foolish. 1 Corinthians 14.4. I'm going to show why I think this. Paul says, the one who speaks in a tongue does what? Come on, church, does what? doesn't say the body, does it? But when we look at the interpretation of the tongue later when it's given to the body, it's to build up the body. This right here is to build up yourself. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 14. Paul says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is what? What is it? Unfruitful. And a lot of times we dismiss it because we're like, I have no clue what I'm saying. I have no clue what's going on. You're robbing yourself of a beautiful gift of edifying and building up your spirit, man. Once again, I say this confidently, but with humility, because I know, I understand there's been so much theology built up against the spirit and his gifts. But if you call Jesus your Lord and scripture is your foundation, we are called to pursue the gifts, to know what they are and to pursue them in our lives. I'm going to read this passage about the um, gift of tongues as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 39 through 40 says, So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not what? I'm going to read it again because I want everyone to say it. I want us to know. I want, to, I want you to understand this. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and what? Do not what? Forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. Once again, don't separate the passion from the purpose. The church of body has forbid the speaking in tongues. And maybe you have done it yourself. The reality is it's available for you. And it's a way to edify and build up your spirit. And guys, listen, I get it. There's been so much abuse and weirdness done in the name of the Holy Spirit. 
In fact, this church body right here, one of the reasons Paul was writing this whole section is because there's been so much abuse and he's trying to bring order. But notice what he, he didn't do. He didn't say tap the brakes or stop. He said eagerly go after it, but do it in order. We, we tap the brakes before we even start. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those charismatics with a seatbelt on. What does that even mean? When it comes to God, I don't want any seatbelts. Why would I want any seatbelts when it comes to God? Isn't is the very foundational core principle of the kingdom surrender? And you're only going to experience God to a level that you're willing to surrender to him. And for some individuals, you got to let go of that seatbelt. you got to click it and loosen it and just run after God and watch what he does in your life. Amen. The last utterance uh, or vocal gift is the gift of prophecy. And this is where you're speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit, a word that brings edification, exhortation, and comfort from the heart of God. Now, this is like I want to I encourage the church, church body to take risks in this, but I also want to encourage you this. Be accountable. A lot of times if you have a, a, like if you have a word for someone, what they'll say, hey, I have a word for you. That's what they're meaning. Hey, I have a prophetic word for you. Call someone to stand with you as you give it to them. And, and, and for some of you, this is something that you have, and you, you need to practice it, but you also need to be accountable. If you miss it, you need to say, hey, I'm sorry I missed it. Or even ask them as you give them the word, does any of this, does any of this um, seem right to you? Does it make sense to you? Does it encourage you? Does it edify you? And also, listen, do not let your prophetic word be the source of correction for someone. Always, the word of God is what corrects people. And sometimes we might have a prophetic word for someone, we give it to them, and we, and we use that as, a, as the basis of correction. No, you always use the word of God to correct people. But allow the prophetic to flow in your life if that's a gift that you, that you operate in. And so the question we ask ourselves is this, like, now what? First, you need to know that by you attending this church, you need to know we are after these things. And I get, once again, I keep saying, I get there's been abuse, there's been crazy things, but you got to realize, of us, as I said many times, the Holy Spirit isn't weird. People are weird. And people do weird things. But don't allow that to discourage you from pursuing the thing that's going to have the greatest impact in your life next to giving your life to Jesus is being filled with the Holy Spirit and seeing the Spirit at work in your life. I don't want to talk about it on a piece of paper I don't want to talk about like some theology or doctrine that we believe. I want to see it happening within this body. I don't want to see it just take place on a Sunday morning within these four walls. I want to hear about it happening in your workplace, in your home. I want to see your, your, your children prophesying over each other and over you. I want, to, I want to see parents laying their hands on their children and speaking words of life over them and prophesying over them. I want to hear testimonies of, hey, I, I, I practiced it. There, I gave a word of knowledge to a colleague at, at work and he was floored. How did you know that? And it led to me sharing the gospel with them. I want to see these things things happening within the church body. Why would God withhold that from us? He won't. It's available for you and I today. And maybe you're not ready for it, and that's fine. We're not going to shove something down your throat. But I want you to know that it's available for you. The first thing you can do is this. There's four encouragements I have for you. Just ask. Ask for it. Begin to ask, I want more of you. Show me what the gifts are for me. What have you given me? I want to operate in them. Give me opportunities. And some of you, maybe this, like I, I'm scared. I'm scared to receive a prayer language. Like if I asked you to raise your hand, I guarantee there's a certain percentage right now that you would raise your hand and say, hey, that, 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 those, them tongues there, they freak me out. But wouldn't that be a brilliant strategy of the devil? 
to get you to be afraid of the one thing that will empower you and strengthen you. Second thing is I encourage you is to receive prayer. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, For this reason I may I remind you to fan into, the, into flame the gift of God, which is in you, how? Through the laying on of my hands. Receive prayer. The third thing is this, is be in community for a few reasons. One, for discovery. For some of you, it'll be like a, kind of like a Samuel Eli moment, you know, where Samuel kept hearing God say, Samuel. He'd run over to Eli, and Eli be like, I didn't say anything. And he kept going back and forth, and finally he caught on and said, hey, 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 next time say, what is it, Lord? Speak to me. And we need people in our life, spiritual fathers and mothers, who will say, hey, 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 that's what's going on in your life right now. That's a word of knowledge. Oh, hey, 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 that's what's going on now. You're, discer- you have a, you're discerning the spirits at work. Hey, that's a prophecy. Like, you're, you need to practice and develop that. Another reason to be in community is for accountability. Too many times there can be abuse when there's no accountability. There needs to be accountability around it. The other thing is for encouragement, for people to encourage you because you're going to miss it and you're going to be discouraged at times. So you need people around you to encourage you. And the fourth thing is this, is risk. Risk. Go for it. Try it. Practice. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that today's service was an encouragement and a blessing to you, and we would love for you to share it with your friends and family. If you have any prayer requests, testimonies, or anything you'd like to share, send us an email at hello at verticallife.church or reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We hope you guys have an awesome week. See you next time.